Welcome, ladies and gents, to uh, the second season of Online GeoTalks. Thank you for joining us. It's great to have you from wherever you are in the world. And tonight we have a very interesting and appropriately titled talk, Social Distancing in the Devonian, by Cameron Penn Clark, who is a, an alumnus of Wits University, and he graduated from the School of Geosciences and the Evolutionary Studies Institute uh, with his PhD in 2017. Uh, he's currently employed in the Belleville Office of the Council of Geosciences as a scientist there in the Geological Resources Directorate. And he's also an honorary researcher in the Evolutionary Studies Institute here at WITS. And after obtaining his PhD, he uh, held various postdoc positions at the Ezekiel Museum in Cape Town. Uh, and also he is an Arthur W. Prowse Fellow of Van Mildred College and Durham University in the UK. And he's got a diverse range of research interests, as I'm sure you will see uh, this evening, and he's going to talk about some of those, but he's really keen on understanding the life and times of the early to middle Paleozoic of West Gondwana. So Cameron, thank you very much for joining us for this talk, and we'll ask you to share your screen and to and to unmic and to unmute yourself right now. And we can go. We have a good audience, just for the records, uh, about 40 people in the audience. Fantastic. Thanks, Grant. OK, Cam, just hang on a second. We can't see your screen just yet. OK. Um, give me a moment. OK. Good, we can see your presentation. Now let's just make sure we can see you. Okay, so, all right, I'll turn the video on. How's that looking? All right, we are nearly there, folks. Um, All right, Cam, you are now your PowerPoint is showing, your video is showing. If we have a bit of bandwidth issues, we will um, we'll just turn off your video, Cam, but for now it seems to be seems to be fine. So you are good to go. Everyone enjoy the thanks talk. Thanks very much. Cameron, thanks very much. Sure, thanks very much, Grant. Uh, welcome everyone. Thanks very much for attending uh, today's talk. Um, it's on something I know that uh, See, well, that uh, some work that I'm uh, just finished with now. Um, so it's quite an appropriate title, I guess, for today's day and age, but it's a biogeographic um, uh, paper that is coming out soon that I've done in conjunction with uh, Dave Harper at Durham University. And what we looked at were looking at social using social networking tools. Uh, to assess cues for long-term uh, isolation and bioregionalization, but using brachiopods of all animals in West Gondwana. So, as always, what I like to do is just give an introduction to folks who don't really know about the Devonian period, what was really planned. About a million years ago, Gondwana was located around the southern period, Gondwana migrated northwards towards Laurisia, eventually colliding uh, later on in the Paleozoic, forming the supercontinent of Pangaea. Um, so that's pretty much gives a, a paleogeographic sort of setting of what was going on. Um, but at the same time as well, when we look at climates at, uh, during this period, is uh, what we do know is that the Devonian overall was a hothouse period, um, so very warm uh, compared to today. 
Um, there weren't any real, uh, well, there's no real evidence for any polar ice caps forming uh, at the South Pole, where Gondwana was the, the largest sort of, or well, the largest landmass uh, located back then. And most of the period, except for the latest Fermanian, uh, so right at the end of the Devonian period, one sees um, these ice caps starting to form. So quite warm um, compared to what it is now. No real ice caps, but at the same time, using lithological indicators for climate, we do see that uh, climate was more or less equitable and uh, divided in these sort of belts uh, as they are today. Um, but from a biological perspective, uh, it's a very interesting period. Um, so just for uh, all my fellow South Africans, to uh, where we are located, we are located right down south around the South Pole during the Devonian period. Now, what was very interesting is that during this time period, we saw the rise of terrestrial plants. So at the beginning of the Devonian period, these very simple um, uh, bryophyte, very simple uh, embryophyte type plants make their appearance and start colonizing land. At the end of the Devonian period, we have the uh, first uh, forests appearing. At the same time as well, animals start making their movement onto land. So arthropods made their first uh, move at um, moving onto land and starting these very early food webs. Um, in the seas, ammonoids um, make their appearance and diversify in a very big way. Um, we also see the rise of crew sharks, uh, ray fin fish and fleshy fin fish, uh, uh, such as coelacanths. And these coexisted alongside these very older order of fishes, orders of fishes, so placoderms, um, acanthodians, and jawless fish. But uh, these guys didn't make the cut at the end of the Devonian period and they went extinct. Um, but what is very interesting are, of course, these, uh, uh, these fleshy fin fish, these coelacanth type animals throughout the Devonian period. Uh, uh, which made their, or these are the first tetrapods that made their movement onto land by the end of the Devonian period. So a lot went on uh, during this time period, and we've got a lot to be, you know, fortunate for that went on, or else we wouldn't be here today. Yeah. Um, so with all of this, I'm just going to ask you to just turn off your video to see if we can get a. It's pretty good, but it's a little bit jumpy in places. So if you can turn off your video, that's perfect. Uh, let's see if that makes it. Uh, All right, fantastic. Okay. Fantastic. So, um, during new organisms that are making their appearance, um, which changes in the way Earth sort of did earthy things. Um, so we saw widespread developments of these biogenically mediated reefs. So they received well, their largest global extent during the Devonian period. Um, and then also at the same time, uh, the rise of, um, of terrestrial plants or terrestrial uh, adapted plants had uh, other effects. So uh, uh, land, we had uh, this encouraged colonization efforts by animals, start of new terrestrial based food webs, new pathways for weathering. Uh, soils also sort of make their real um, appearance, if you could call it that. Um, and we also have a change in in the way terrestrial environments work. So, you can, for instance, if we look at the way, the way uh, rivers uh, flowed and meandered and uh, what have you, went from braided vegetation type river systems to more meandering type river systems. So uh, plants really did a hell of a lot uh, to change the way Earth worked. At the same time, there were a, a lot of these things that were going on. There was, um, you know, quite a lot of extinction events that was, were going on during the Devonian. So there's about a dozen that are known. <coughs> a lot of these, um, were the most famous of which is the, are the end Devonian extinction events. Uh, which happened in the Frania and Fermanian, um, but lesser known are these other smaller, and I use this in inverted commas, um, extinction events that happened during the middle and early Devonian period. So um, generally the, what happens, uh, uh, 
or what we how these manifest these are generally short term manifest in a marine organism uh, marine environments that affect benthonic organisms uh, uh, and there's a lot of evidence for dysoxia um, so there, there's no real indication on how these <coughs> bless me how these extinction events occurred but it does seem as that possibly um, plants the rise of plants coupled with Milankovitch cycles could have had a um, an overriding feature or cause for these extinction events. But of course, this still needs to be investigated. Perhaps the most interesting part about the Devonian period um, was the it was last real time we saw major on mass um, uh, uh, large scale um, biological uh, hotspots. Um, so during the Paragian to the Arfelian, so the early to middle Devonian period in the marine realm, we saw these you know, three large um, uh, biogeographic realms. So the old world realm, which hovered around the, um, the equator back then, Eastern America's realm, which was with more temperate latitudes, and the Malvino Caffric, which is down south, um, of which you know, West Gondwana occupied. Um, so these have been identified on the basis of invertebrate species and groups that are endemic to these regions. And at the end of the Arfelian, all of these um, biorealms collapsed. Um, and what we see is more of a sort of mixing um, type effect and uh, more cosmopolitanism. Uh, and this is a trend that continued into the late Devonian. And this pretty much is what my talk is about. So just to to go on, uh, just to digress a little bit, just to chat about what paleo <coughs> what is paleobiogeography. This is essentially the study of the distribution of organisms um, or their phylogenetic relationships in geographic space. But the difference is that <coughs> this is looking in the geologic past. So um, this is just an example, a modern day example of the uh, Wallace line. So anyone who's done um, biology at university will know that the Wallace's line is a sort of a biogeographic boundary, <coughs> boundary that is drawn between Australia and Asia. And what one can see is that east of this line, you generally have a lot more uh, marsupials, there's cockatoos, there's a whole bunch of other uh, cute and cuddly creatures that one doesn't get uh, moving out west towards Asia. Um, and generally, there are different mechanisms for how um, how these um, bioregions come about. Um, there's different mechanisms, but essentially um, all of these mechanisms uh, result in some form of isolation, um, niche specialization by animals that are, or plants that are sort of trapped behind those uh, uh, borders and and speciation events. So in what we can do as paleobiogeographers, we can uh, go back in time and have a look at uh, the context of these, uh, how they occurred and so forth. So these can, things can be discussed in terms of paleogeography, uh, paleoclimates and paleoceanography, past tectonic events, as well as biocrises and bio events, um, which I'm all of which interested in. So just to give a brief history on Devonian paleogeography. Um, this has been something that has been noticed since the 1800s. Uh, these are pre-tectonic pre paleogeographic maps on, on how these bioregions existed. It's been well known and well established that um, there some um, entrenched um, causes for bioregionalization. So pre-plate tectonic ideas thought that um, there were these hypothetical land bridges that linked uh, the continents <coughs> and that um, that we had these allopatric barriers, these geographic barriers that formed due to changes in sea level and flooding, flooding of these um, uh, land bridges. Um, and this is where some of these, the original terminology for these uh, bioregions uh, sort of made their appearance. Um, moving forward into the um, mid to late 20th century with the advent of plate tectonics <coughs> is that plate tectonics uh, was actually quite nice in that um, 
or there's a good correlation of, of where these consonants were located with other uh, uh, phenomena such as lithologic um, indicators of climate and plate orientation. What is actually quite interesting over here is that what uh, scientists started to pick up is that um, is that you know actually this makes more sense and um, some ideas that started to pop up uh, as of which were um, new uh, barriers, ideas for barriers for speciation and isolation you know, being tectonic dependent climatic or latitude dependent cl climatic forcing, tectonic configuration or paleo-oceanographic regimes, which is sort of a half and half um, of both ideas. Um, so this goes, this is just a more recent study that was done uh, looking at these bioregions. Uh, this is by colleagues in Australia and uh, what they did, they used an approach to assess the validity, validity of each of these bioregions. Uh, so the three big bioregions, the Eastern Americas, Malvino, Caffric and Old World realms. And what they found is that um, these bioregions uh, don't manifest as any uh, natural area except for the Malvino, Caffric realm. Um, and they also found that the Malvino Caffric realm couldn't be subdivided into smaller bioregions. Um, so there, of course, is a hierarchy as there is in South Africa, for instance, we've got a country uh, that is subdivided into provinces, just subdivided into municipalities, districts, etc. Um, and what is also quite interesting as well, what um, if you look at the time chart that they show is that when you get to the Javertian, um, is that a lot of these bioregions seem to collapse and um, don't make it past. So of interest, was the Lakovian Javertian was a time of widespread endemism and there after was a time more of cosmopolitanism, but more of like an old world takeover. Um, is that these these uh, Okies that were living up north, these animals, these creatures up north, uh, tent, were invaded uh, down south and just took over. So I thought this was very interesting to try and investigate what uh, was the cause of this. So going back to the Malvino Catholic realm, uh, um, as a realm, uh, by region, it's wholly restricted to southwestern Gondwana, uh, hovers around the South Pole, and it was first recognized on the basis of several endemic brachiopods and later trilobites. And it went through a whole bunch of different names of so Flavolite land, Austral province, Falklandia, in the Malvino Caffrician province. So that was by um, a husband and wife uh, team, the river. And, and then, then you break it down Malvino Malvinas Islands and Caffric for Caffraria, um, the colonial name for, uh, for the Amatoza Kingdom in present day Eastern Cape Province, South Africa. And we'll be discussing this name uh, shortly. So, as I mentioned earlier, um, the Malvino Caffric realm is, has long been thought to just occupy uh, the highest latitudes so of 60 to 90 degrees south. Um, there's also inclusion, if you want to call it that, so Ghana, um, as well as Senegal. Um, so there's big question marks if, if they actually are part of the Malvino Caffric realm. But essentially, in this extended out into South America, into present-day sub-equatorial regions, out into um, also into Antarctica and into the Falkland Islands. Um, so that is a, as an actual bioregion, but there, there are uh, faunas which typify the Malvino Caffric realm, and those uh, there are one or two elements that can be found in uh, Australia, New Zealand, and North Africa. So sort of expats are such that you know, decided to leave, um, but yeah. So when we talk about uh, the sort of key index taxa, there's there's only a handful of them. So there are several um, brachiopods uh, which typify uh, the Malvino Caffrium. So there's a, a bunch of uh, Rhynchonolatans, a bunch of Strophomonatans, but um, I won't go through all of these names. In a, um, as such. Um, but the big question is we don't really know where they come from and they had some sort of ancestors that uh, lived 
or some commonality with the so-called Eastern America, uh, America's realm, or they could be holdovers from a previous um, um, biogeographic region uh, called the Afro-South American realm, which existed during the Silurian, but uh, there's still some debate. And to include a bunch of um, more cooler organisms, I guess. Um, so, a bunch of trilobites, these phacopide trilobites are called monads. Uh, these guys are very holy to the region. Uh, there's some other groups of delmonotides and homolonotides and proteides, um, or prutides, sorry, um, uh, some of which are endemic only at genus and species level. And some ostracods, um, which are endemic as well. Bivalves and gastropods, that seems like there are one or two, but we don't really know. Um, so this group has been neglected for a very long time and really needs a proper um, assessment of what's going on. And there are a bunch of echinoderms. Um, so there's in the mid one or two that appear to be endemic to the Malvino Catholic realm, but uh, these organisms seem to be um, cosmopolitan and have a lot in common with uh, other echinoderms up north. The Malvino Catholic, though, is very um, it's sort of weird because it's typified on, on the things it doesn't have. So it's a bit weird is that these organisms of, yeah, so conulorids, hyalithids, and tentaculatids are very common, but some organisms are quite rare. So um, coral, were located around the South Pole back then, cooler water and probably intermittent uh, periods of sunlight. Um, but some organisms are quite weird that aren't there. So graptolites um, aren't present, which is a problem because then we'd be able to age date these things with ease. Uh, conodonts are seemingly absent as well, which is also a bit of a shocker. Goniotites um, are, are rare. Uh, you do see in Bolivia, uh, one or two have been found, but these things obviously are migrants from elsewhere. And there are a bunch of brachiopods that are also widespread during the Devonian period, which are absent. So rhynchonellides, tripods, and pentamerides. But our new research suggests that there are one or two rhynchonellides and the tripods in the, um, in the Malvino Catholic realm. So it's research for another day. So when we think of these things, these animals living together around the South Pole, they must have, we, what we do know is that uh, based on the sedimentology of these successions is that it was broadly shallow marine siliciclastic environments, so pretty much similar to what we have off the, uh, around this present day South African coastline, very sandy, um, storm and wave dominated, um, shore face type environments where they, uh, lived in and um, again around the South Pole, there weren't any car or very few car or no real carbonate reefs, free of polar ice caps and, and the majority of these animals had been thick lifestyles, so they lived on the substrate itself and it's thought that uh, these guys lived in peace and harmony in that, um, that these, these uh, strong thermal boundary prevented any exchange with organisms from the north. So Looking at the Malvino Catholic realm itself, there have been previous attempts to subdivide the realm into smaller regions and um, the basis of, uh, of trilobite taxa. So the taxonomy, the problem is, is with this is that the taxonomy varies from country and uh, the taxonomy is questionable. So we actually need some cross-continental division to take place over here. Um, and yeah, and also other studies that focus on particular groups. But there are some um, patterns is that within the Malvino Catholic one can see there's, there's this clear east-west schism. So um, pretty much everything in Bolivia and the pre-Cordillera in, uh, in South America that is in uh, Brazil and the Parana, um, as well as the Ventana in uh, um, East and South America, um, and there's also this punch suspicion that the Andean region was probably the point origin for all these organisms, and there's also some inference as well as that through time that um, there has been some demonstration that uh, sea level 
uh, must have acted as a, a mechanism for vicariance and due dispersal, so for isolation and dispersal mechanisms as such, but this is quite sketchy in that um, a lot of the time we refer to the global sea level curve, but we don't really know what was causing changes in sea level during the Devonian since there were no ice caps. So this is another bugaboo I have about some of these models, um, but still they are interesting, they are valid and we need to take them on board. So at some time during the latest Eiffelian, um, the, we see a, a collapse in global uh, bioendemism and bioregions around the world. Um, it's very difficult to estimate when this took place in uh, southwestern Gondwana is that there are very poor biostratigraphic and chronostratigraphic constraints. But generally is the case um, when we see these brachiopods, these are what I call halving a taxon or taxa, um, so tropidoleptis and rapidothyrus. These guys um, are sort of old world um, markers from these more warmer regions. And generally is the case is that when one sees these brachiopods uh, in uh, fossil assemblages, the typical Malvino capric uh, fossils or uh, taxa aren't there. Um, so it seems what we do see is that these, the collapse of these bioregions and the movement towards um, cosmopolitanism seems to be tied to um, one of these extinction events. We, um, so either the Kachak, the Hotesh, or the Dalaji, or all, we don't really know. But what we do know is that whenever we see closure of these um, of these biogeographic regions in the Malvino Catholic realm, um, it always does seem to be linked to transgressive events. So it's been seen so far in Bolivia, um, in Brazil, in Argentina, the Falkland Islands, and in the Bokefalk group. Um, so, but this is a story for another day. Hopefully I'll get time to finish this paper this year um, uh, to describe this. So this is also quite interesting stuff. So the idea is, is that um, a global transgressive event during the, um, the late Eiffelian, so here we can see on this uh, curve over here, um, seems to coincide with the closure of the Malvino Catholic realm. And it seems that what probably happened is that um, this sort of thermal divide probably shut down um, with an influx of warm water. And uh, these old world realm, realm brachiopods when organisms invaded uh, these cooler water conditions and probably um, these uh, Malvino Catholic fauna didn't enjoy it uh, so much and then they unfortunately went extinct and were replaced. So this study um, that we um, uh, well, to go on now what we are doing um, so we've asked several questions. We've asked, um, are existing and established bioregions valid natural regions or are they constructs and how do they compare to past ideas? Uh, can any identified bioregions be subdivided further? What were the causes for provincialism at high latitudes? Um, and we decided that brachiopods are perhaps the best organism uh, to test this idea. So this is for uh, a paper of ours that is coming out um, sometime soon in the bulletins of the Geological Society of America, so keep an eye out for it. Um, it should be open access um, to try and promote inclusive and free learning. Um, so what we did was we collected brachiopod occurrence data uh, from throughout Western Gondwana, uh, so these are all these sites that we uh, looked at, from the Prague and Javetian. Um, the only place that we didn't manage to get data from was from the Suwani basin in uh, Florida and Georgia and that there's not really much um, published on that stuff. Um, we looked at genus level um, distributions and we created a presence absence data matrix uh, from this to analyze. Um, so we selected um, genus level um, owing to any inherent biases, biases that my, may exist with identification. Uh, we also took single occurring taxa out of our analyses in that uh, some of these single tax or these unique tax are might uh, skew analyses. And we, so in total, we had 206 genera from 17 regions and um, 
yeah, these things were assessed with a very extensive literature review. Limitations of the study is that we assume that all taxonomic considerations are correct and assume that original identifications of the genera were correct. So there's a bit of a, I'm admitting weakness over here. So what I say by an extensive literature review, we really went at it. Um, I've managed to get papers in just about in, you know, any language possible. So stuff that was written in French, some stuff that was written in Spanish, Portuguese, um, even here in Cyrillic. So a friend of mine managed to translate this for me. Um, so I was very grateful for that. Um, and uh, stuff that is even written in German. And a lot of these papers aren't actually known to the Western world, or so Western English speaking world. And a lot of the stuff is actually pretty good. Um, and a lot of it, unfortunately, is flying is flown under the radar due to these isolation issues due to language. So I can tell you now, fellow South Africans, if you are doing any work in Gondwana, we need to go across the um, the Atlantic and visit what's going on there. South America, lots going on, especially Brazil. Um, Brazilians are doing a damn good job at um, at sorting this out. So. We looked at diversity trends. So this is just a um, paleo or paleogeographic map showing all these regions and these um, diversity trends. And what we noticed is that in the northern part of Western Gondwana um, is that pretty much all groups were represented. But when we move down south, you know, quite important groups that up north aren't present. So pentamerides and spiriferinides are um, are absent. Um, what we noticed is that diversity was greatest in northern West Gondwana and decreased southwards. Um, so within the Malvino Kafric realm, which would have been around here in uh, 60 degrees south, this diversity was focused on specific groups of on sporophorides, productides, rhynchonellides, thyroidides, tripides, and strophaminides. Um, and there was low diversity overall um, in terebratulides, orthides, and also tetides, but we won't worry about that. Um, what's also something that's quite striking is that these large depot centers, so the, the Chaco, the Precordillera, the Piranha, and the Cape Basin seem to be um, uh, places of great diversity. Um, but this is probably a collecting bias um, in that these outcrops are a little bit more accessible than these other smaller regions. So you might be asking why brachiopods, and this is pretty much what they look like. And generally is the case when I tell people, hey, you know, I'm an invertebrate paleontologist. They don't be like, oh, you know, I've got a mate who studies um, you know, sea scorpions or trilobites, and what do you do? And then generally when I say I, I look at uh, brachiopods, I'm sort of visited by very confused and befuzzled face um, and then people are like really wow okay um, so the reason why brachiopods of the study is you know they were very past uh, very diverse in the past especially in the paleozoic um, today they're just represented by a measly sort of half handful um, of representatives uh, during the Devonian especially over here in the early middle Devonian uh, where we are looking at, their diversity reached their peak. Um, and they occupied an array of benthic niches um, and they were progressively outcompeted by mollusks and they really haven't recovered much since the Paleozoic. And I guess it's okay. Um, I guess mollusks are you know, more tasty than brachiopods. So uh, I guess it's, it's a, it's a lose-win situation in some ways. So brachiopods, you know, yeah, um, during their larval phase, they're quite active little guys, they're actually quite cute. So this is just some a video of some of these larval baby brachiopods swimming around. But they grow up into these very inactive um, filter feeders. So this is a video of the brachiopod feeding, and this has been sped up, I think, four times. And it doesn't look like much is going on. So um, brachiopods, themselves, especially articulate brachiopods such as this guy over here, uh, have limited environmental tolerance. So they're very susceptible to changes in salinity, substrate temperature and depth. And since they have a historically large component of 
Benthos and marine environments, we argue that they are good indicators for environment and community level stability. Um, in that they don't really go anywhere. So yeah, to save us time before you guys fall asleep, let's move on. So again, why brachiopods? I'm hoping now you guys agree with me in that these are pretty good indicators for paleobiogeography. So we've run a lot of analyses, uh, different analyses with our data sets. So the first of course is cluster analysis. And uh, this is a cladistic analysis for classifying and grouping associations uh, in the sort of in a hierarchical manner. And this is pretty good for incomplete data sets. So this, these are sort of cladograms that show, this is, these are phylogenetic uh, cladograms that show the relationships among different invertebrate groups. And here it's been applied to show different uh, well, sort of similarities and differences and groupings among Germanic languages. Um, so this is pretty much in the language here is where it first sort of came about. We've also looked at non using uh, non-metric multidimensional scaling methods, and this is an ordination method that uh, groups similar sites together. And uh, what you do is you take these dots are sort of spat out into multidimensional space, and what what we do is we constrain it into a minimum spanning tree to resolve the closeness of sites. Uh, to each other um, and what this pretty much does is it tries to find the shortest route possible uh, to link nodes together. So um, it's generally is the case uh, in biology is that one uses the possible principle of parsimony so the simplest answers is probably the correct one. But excitingly we used a, a new analysis um, called network analysis and this is what's pretty much been used in social media. So this is a device to analyze social interactions among objects and uh, the ties that bind them. So this is generally the case when you're on Facebook and you think, oh, my shucks, you know, how, do, how does Facebook know that I know this person? Um, and it pretty much uses all of that metadata in the background to find out um, who you may know. But what's actually interesting now is that uh, this has evolved to uh, a bunch of other applications. So these are examples over here of um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, how network analysis has been used. So this top part of here is a phylogenetic um, relationships among uh, strains of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, so just shows the, um, the genomes according to different areas and how they've evolved from a point source area. And this over here is, this is a data set of several millions of data points looking at pub public opinions regarding COVID-19. So the green on the left are more conservative opinions and the purple on the right more liberal opinions. And what you can actually see is that there's a clear division between the two. So um, this is just one example, but in geosciences, we are starting to use this now, so it's biogeography, it's got uh, instant applications for it. It's been used in mineral mineralogy and ore body characterization, and it has some potential as well to be used in structural geology and geological engineering, as well as hydrogeology and water exploration. So it's a pretty new, pretty cool technique to use. So looking at our data, um, so this, these are the results from the cluster analysis. So what one sees is a um, clustering of tra traditional malvino caffric regions together. Um, and this limited data set also shows that the um, some regions, the Beauvais, which is in um, Senegal, and the Acraeans don't seem to cluster with these other regions of here in green. Um, and what we also see also, which is quite interesting, is that these traditional Eastern America's realm, uh, these guys here at the M, these regions don't seem to cluster together either. Um, and these old world regions, you know, can argue that they don't really cluster either. I mean, over here, you've got something that was probably malvino caffric or thought to be malvino caffric Eastern America's old world realm and the sort of mix between the two all clustering together. So instantly we could see that it doesn't seem um, as if these places are natural regions. But what we did notice are some patterns, is that if we look at how these branches 
the major branch, which is over at this node with the number 23, we can see is that there is some pattern going on. If we consult the paleobiogeographic map, we can see that Senegal, the Llanos Basin, which is up here in Venezuela, Colombia, and the uh, North and South Saharan regions seem to occur at the same or similar paleo latitude. Similarly, these malvino caffric regions, as well as these other Eastern American re uh, regions, so the Amazonas Basin, the Paranaiba, and the Zaritas Basin, all seem to coincide in latitudes greater than 60 degrees south. So I thought, well, that's quite interesting. And what we've seen as well, if we go up on this branch again, is that one can see other divisions as well taking place, is that one can actually see is a separation, you know, moving inwards on the circle on these latitudes. Is there's this other region here, which we will get to its uh, origin name, the Malvina Tozen region as well as the Amazonian region, which is located just up north over here. So these were quite some interesting patterns that we started seeing um, in our data. So there seems to be, if you could imagine, a bunch of rings moving inwards, uh, so too are these, um, these regions of um, these groupings. But what we also notice as well that some regions don't seem to have any real patterns. So these are the um, Parsis, the Ventana and the Fox Bay, which is so there's the Ventana, Fox Bay, depending on who you believe where the Falklands are. There uh, yes, West Antarctica and the uh, Parsis up here. These smaller basins don't seem to, to make any sense where they occur. Um, but this is probably due to a, a function of limited data due to historic collection biases and it's probably an artifact. So in the two-way cluster analysis one can see these patterns as well so this just shows uh, the relatedness of the taxa versus the places that they occur and what one can see these green dots show these typical malvino caffric uh, brachiopods and you can see that there's a strong clustering together on these graphs. Um, so you can see that in the malvino closen there's a lot of them uh, moving on down to the Amazonian, less or so, and then in the Colombian West African region, which is uh, this, that northern region, um, which I'll get to in a bit, um, they, uh, they are even less of them. And the similarities don't end there. When we looked at the NMDS, we superimposed these data onto a minimum spanning tree. And again, we see a strong clustering of malvino caffric regions uh, separate to others. Um, again, what we also see is that the Ukraine and the Beauvais are unconstrained, so these are quite clearly separate from the, the rest of the traditional malvino caffric realm regions. Um, but again, uh, it's stressed that these are probably due to collection biases. But we also see as well is that these latitudinal regions is, seems to be a strong tie why these latitudinal regions are, um, uh, are, are controlling them, uh, or there is a control. And again, we look at these relationships, we can see that the Amazonas shows some, uh, some sort of similarity of the earth between the Parnaiba and the Amazonas basin. So the Amazon bioregion seems to be a real thing, as well as the malvino tozen region. Um, and what's also interesting as well is that the smaller divisions this, uh, within the malvino tozen the uh, Andeo um, South African, which was over here, as well as the piranha, you can always already see that there's some something going on over here. So it's quite interesting that we started to see these latitudinal um, um, uh, controls over the fauna or their distributions. Then lastly, we looked at a network analysis, and this is well sort of it constructs more than just a pretty picture. So here we color coded depot centers according to the, the second and third order of the large bioregions that were elucidated in the cluster analysis and the um, NMDS. Um, and this is this is by no means been tweaked or played with. Um, and what we can see is that we start seeing that these regions definitely start pulling out in different uh, regions. Um, 
um, and what we can see is that there's a strong clustering of these uh, depot centers in accordance to their um, buyer regions or their home home buyer re regions as such. And these are the relationships among these buyer regions. So it's no surprise in that um, the that we are seeing these things. But what's also interesting as well is that if we have to superimpose the latitudinal sort of lines on top of these data, again, we are seeing some patterns. We are seeing a strong support for this high latitude bioregion uh, separate from this temperate latitude bioregion, um, as well as smaller divisions within the Malvino Clausen. So being this Andeo South African, you can see it's quite closely uh, pulls together and the Piranha Basin being something altogether very different. Um, so also as other points of interest, we can see as well possible migration routes that uh, these brachiopods when they were in their larval form could have uh, distributed along. So the Amazonas and the Parnaiba, the um, uh, Amazonian uh, bioregion is probably an intermediary between the Malvino Tourism and the Colombian West African bioregions. And we can see that um, interchange probably took place between the Beauvais and the Amazonas, as well as the Parnaiba and the Chaco. And if we look, consult our paleogeographic map, we can see that these regions were in close proximity to each other back then. So it's actually quite nice is that for the first time we start, we're starting to see migration routes. So our new model um, suggests that previous assumptions of bioregions need, of West Gondwana need a revamp. Uh, the Eastern America's realm and the Old World realms are totally artificial, um, supporting uh, work that has been done by Dowding and Ebuck. Um, the Malvino Catholic realm is somewhat valid, but there's a big but. Its area is reduced to exclude Senegal, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, so this region up north. Um, as well as um, Ghana. We're not really sure what's going on. It's again, there's very little work that's been done on the Ukraine and to include Northern Chile, which is over here by the Zaritas Basin. Um, its rank has also changed to a third order level. So it's no longer, we don't really see it as evidence. We don't really have evidence for it being a large um, first order by region, so no longer sort of equivalent, it's more equivalent of a province than what it is of a realm. And that latitudinal forcing had a strong influence on the distribution of brachiopod taxa within these belts. So there's a probable climatic and ecological control, and we need more research to look at salinity, temperature, fugacity, etc. Um, but also interestingly, the um, the network analysis suggests that barriers for migration weren't entirely limited and that there was some communication among these West Gondwana and depot centers, you know, to a point. So that's pretty much what our new model shows. And there's a trend, um, there are these trends that, are, are, uh, that one sees. So our new model suggests that there are two uh, first to second order level divisions, namely a temperate uh, latitude bioregion and a high latitude bioregion. Within the temperate uh, latitude bioregion, we see one grouping so far, the so-called Colombian West African bioregion. Um, in the high latitude bioregion, the Amazonian bioregion, um, and then in, uh, down south, south of 70 degrees south, the Malvino Tozen um, bioregion, which was probably between 70 and 90 degrees south. And we see, well, we think there are two possible groupings uh, based on this pattern that one is seeing of polewood um, uh, sort of uh, changes in bioregions. So the Piranha being um, at the highest latitude and um, having probably, you know, we thought, we think these assemblages are probably dominated by the Malvino tools and brachiopods. For now, we have linked uh, these other smaller basins within the Andeo South African uh, bioregion until we get more data from these smaller basins, so from the Parsis, the Ventana, the Fox Bay, and uh, West Antarctica. So we'll see what um, what the future brings. So the Amazonian itself is a true intermediary, um, and some exchange took place pretty much over here and along here. Um, so yes, 
So going on to now, uh, probably one of the most important points of this talk is that we have decided to synonymize the um, Malvino torsum with the Malvino Caffric. And this is because of something that we actually, as a scientific community, need to have a, a real sit down and think about is the continued use of racist terminology in the uh, scientific literature. So I don't need to spell it out, but um, the CAFRIC part of Malvino CAFRIC has got um, racist and variations thereof have racist connotations. Um, so uh, CAFRIC itself is from CAFRERIA, which was the um, the name given to the uh, Amatosa or what is it? We recognize as the Amatosa kingdom and uh, her people um, for the Eastern Cape province. And it still pops up in scientific literature, um, both as the name of uh, uh, animals and plants as well as fossils. And this is something that we should look at removing. It, there's no excuse for this. It has to be taken out. Um, so we've decided to, to take that out and replace it with Gozen uh, to refer a more suitable word to refer to the Amatosa kingdom and her people, the original inhabitants of the Eastern Cape who were subjugated during colonial exploits in South Africa. So this is just a way in which we are hoping to use fossils uh, to, to fix the past. Well, not to fix the past, but to heal the past. One can never fix it. We can only heal it. Um, so going back to this now, uh, looking at um, the differences, these even smaller differences in the um, Malvino Tosum uh, bioregion between the Andeo South African and the Piranha bioregions. This is something that I'm scratching my head about um, in that the, a lot of good work and has come out of South America, especially Brazil at the moment. And thanks guys for that. Um, but it does seem surprising that there's a surprising low apparent diversity among brachiopods overall. Um, and um, this is, seems to be among uh, terebratulides, productides, and orthotetides, and there are no orthids being present at all. So there's something about those types of brachiopods that, are, that we probably need to explore in future. And it could be one of two things is that there could be a strong ecological reason why those groups couldn't persist at um, these very high latitudes, so perhaps they couldn't take a pedicle hold on um, there, maybe it was too cold or, or too rough or, or what we don't know, or um, just simply that um, more taxonomical work has to be done to recognize them. So this is something I want my colleagues in Brazil to, to think about in future, is what's going on with those groups and is this an actual real thing that we are observing or it could be some sort of bias. Um, so going on for the drivers now, this is the last part. Um, it seems that global temperature overall was a determining factor for uh, global bioregionalization. And what's actually quite interesting is that it seems to have peaked during this cool phase during the Lakovian Javetian. So if you look at this as a global curve, a global average curve, and what one can see is a clear pattern in that uh, we've got entrenched by regionalization taking place during this anomalous cold snap, you could call it, that during the Lakovian Javetian. So there was something, there were probably these thermal barriers that had an influence over um, sort of niche selection among these brachiopods. And this there's no surprise that it ended during a warming phase. So we see that there's this warming phase that sort of takes place uh, uh, during the earliest Javetian, and you have this sort of global collapse in these bioregions. And here within um, uh, within West Gondwana, we see uh, previous work that has been done is that the uh, old terminology, East Americas, especially the Venezuela, Colombia um, province collapsed the Malvino Torsum, Malvino Caffric um, uh, collapsed. And what we do see is that there's this old world takeover. Um, so there was probably something going on. Now we need to ask, what was that? Um, so I've started looking at this. Um, it's a story for another day. Uh, Malvino Torsum bioregion never really recovered. Um, so that's research that should be coming out sometime later this year. But we need to ask what was causing, what caused this cold snap 
and uh, during this overall warm period and what caused it to end. So is it something to do with the rise of plants and the first forest changes in orbital forcing or something even more catastrophic? So looking towards the future, uh, we need to remember that biogeographic barriers are hypothetical constructs that can only stand if they can be tested. So um, we should remember is that uh, we are scientists and we should continue to ask questions and we should continue to, trust, to test things before we trust them. So um, we should expand this into East Gondwana and eventually Larissa, because what's interesting, if you look in the sort of line of sight, uh, Gondwana, uh, or sorry, New Zealand and um, parts of um, Antarctica, as well as de depending on this reconstruction where Australia was located on more or less in line of sight of the Colombian uh, West African bioregion. So it'd be very interesting to see how these compare um, out east and to look at a more global um, uh, picture of this to see if this is a pattern happening in uh, Larissa. Um, should maybe also expand this to include more mobile organisms um, and even perhaps one day uh, look at um, similar analyses but using entire communities to see if the same trends are observable. So it's important to note that work such as this is important on good, uh, is reliant on good taxonomy. Uh, so the Malvina Tourism Group is in dire need of revision. Um, and there needs to be an investment in paleo sciences, especially fundamental taxonomy. A lot of um, a lot of departments around the world are focusing on analyzing their data. Meantime, a lot of the times the data that they've got is incomplete slash rubbish. Um, so I can tell you now, there needs to be some investment back on good old school taxonomical um, studies. Um, and also more into Gondwana research needs to take place. Um, as I say, the South Americans are, are really, you know, you guys are doing such a good job, you know, um, and yeah, we need to actually talk more and create stronger ties to, you know, reunite Gondwana as such. And, you know, the Aussies can tag along as well, uh, as well as the New Zealanders. We, we like you guys. Um, we also need to understand, we'll look at how smaller depot basins fit in this model. Um, so we need to try and intensify collecting and incorporate data from Ghana, the Ventana, the, the Falklands and Antarctica. And also as well, we need to see if these biogeographic regions uh, shift through time. So we need better inferences for age constraints in the Devonian of West Gondwana. And unfortunately, South Africa is the last clue in solving this question that we are doing a very, very shoddy job at trying to date our rocks. Well, if they are, have not got mineral resources, we don't care. So um, we need to change that now because um, it could be something interesting. So this link also between latitude and climate with biodiversity and its demise needs to be explored further. Um, so there's a good link between these phenomena and bio crises as well as looking at the innovation of organisms. So more multi-proxy and interdisciplinary research is required. We need, of course, empirical data on salinity, temperature, oxygen, fugacity, isotopic stuff, geochemical stuff. You know, this is needed first and foremost. And we need to link all of these data sets back to fundamental um, um, sort of uh, topics being sedimentology, stratigraphy, sequence strat, and geochron, of course, with the taxonomy. So there's a lot of there's a hell of a lot of work to do. And also, why is this important? Well, we need to think of we need to start having a serious think now of what a non or what polar regions are going to be like without ice caps in the future, uh, since we are doing a, a pretty good slash bad job at melting them. Um, so we need to start looking at I, uh, how uh, these sort of environments and ecologies react to changes. So as you all know, poles of, the poles are very, very sensitive to changes in sea level and temperature. So similar to the Javetian, we are entering a global warming phase. We need to understand these past bioregions and their interactions among these communities to try and help and forward model and predict how these how organisms will re react in, um, in future. Um, and of course, looking at benthonic organisms is, is probably first and foremost in that they're the most vulnerable to you know, environmental change and form the one of the largest components in marine trophic webs. 
And if those collapse, fisheries collapse, everything collapses and we will probably die. So we need to, we need, this is why stuff like this is important. And that's me and really thank you so much um, from my bracket pots would probably say the same from the bottom of their pedicles to the tip of their apertures. Thank you very much for all of your support. Uh, Council for Geoscience has been extremely supportful uh, in this. I uh, thank the executive um, for giving me permission to go across to Durham University uh, to conduct this research as my collaborator, uh, Dave Harper. Um, I just joined the CGS for a month before um, I got the opportunity to go over um, where I was uh, a post uh, a research fellow. So thank you very much for that opportunity. Of course, gratitude goes to um, to uh, to Vitz and the ESI. Uh, thank you very much as well for being an incubator uh, for allowing me to do these this sort of research through the years. I know I must have made people mad, especially myself, uh, by looking at invertebrates. So thank you, and of course my my uh, friends and colleagues at Geos the Geosciences Department. Thank you, and thank you for also providing this um, platform for GeoTalks. Really, thank you very much. And of course, the DSI and NRF. Um, yeah, thank you as well. Also, throughout the years, for giving me money to do this stuff. Um, this stuff has got very high, high, far-reaching implications in the future. I believe it does, and it's a way of putting South Africa on the map and uh, showing that we can be hubs of innovation. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, keep well during these crazy times and be safe. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you. That was excellent. Uh, you can keep your keep your slides up, uh, just in okay. case you have questions you want to go back for. Um, there are a few questions, so if you have some time, let's ask a few of them. Sure. Uh, and I think this is a super cool methodology you've applied here. And uh, the first question that we have uh, comes from Victor, who I think is from the ESI. So thanks for watching, Victor. Um, what do network analyses do or tell you that other, perhaps more traditional or older analyses don't tell you? Well, the big thing for, for me is that um, what I like about it is it shows, uh, visually shows the interrelationships um, of your data sets. So uh, from that perspective over there, I, I like it in that you, I believe you can't use one or the other. You have to use both together. So it's a way of actually maximizing your traditional data sets. So it's a way of, I guess, milking more out of these patterns that you see initially. So yeah, I. I, I really like network analysis for that reason. Okay. Um, then we have a question, two questions from Martin actually. Uh, the first is, does this new clustering affect the thinking on Gondwanan reconstruction at all? Um, so this is uh, something I've also thought about uh, at some to some sort of uh, at some length is unfortunately also the other thing with paleobiogeography is it's it's very much uh, controlled by uh, what the paleogeographic uh, reconstruction itself is. Um, so in our case over here is that it seems that the, the two go hand in hand uh, with one another and probably if we could, uh, if, uh, I'm just showing one on my title screen over here, is that these question marks over here, so this is of course the Akrayan and this is southern Peru. And depending on where these guys could sit, it could change the reconstruction of Gondwana. And um, for me, it's more of a rotational thing is uh, that probably if we uh, show that the Akrayan was more Malvino Tozan in character and South Peru more Colombian West African in uh, character, there'd be some rotation of Gondwana. Uh, within those latitudes. So I think the two will work together. It's just, well, I'm trying to go across to, uh, to Ghana, uh, hopefully next year to have a look at their collections and try to see if we can refine this a little bit. So as it stands, no, but could it change it? Yes. Okay, and Martin also asks, how difficult would it be to overcome the collection biases? to constrain some of these areas and, and are we talking about needing thousands of more samples or is it a little less rigorous than that? Well, the thing is, is and this is a problem I've seen worldwide, 
is a lot of the times the biases themselves are, how can I put this in a very nice way? It's sometimes it's dependent on the museum or the repository where it's at, is that these data do exist. The problem is, is that in a lot of cases, uh, they exist in museums on dusty shelves and no one knows about them. So um, a lot of this uh, stuff requires people to actually go through their museums and also science councils, uh, funding agencies, universities, etc., investing in their museums and also investing programs where people go and look at the, the um, their fossils and the data that they have. Um, speaking of which, going back to visiting collections, um, the collections at the Council for Geoscience themselves uh, have been very important in this um, uh, this paper, um, and that the data that I got from those collections, just picking through them uh, over the past few years, has been very vital. Um, so to have the collections at, um, at Ezeko Museums in Cape Town, the issue is, is that these collections are virtually unknown. And I think research like this is important in that it makes people aware where those data are and people go and revisit it and have a look at them again. So I, I personally believe a lot of this stuff has been collected. It just needs to be looked at again. Okay, great. And we'll end up with one last question, which I think illustrates the importance of looking across Gondwana. This is from Renato Gigliardi, uh, who I believe is from Brazil. Uh, knows you can. So um, the question is the cluster analysis considers the taxa of the whole Devonian, correct? So can these analyses be done with taxa in certain specific periods, for example, the Francian or the Gavintian? Um, because here in Brazil, during the Gavintian, there is a pretty represented uh, period in our rocks where there was an increase in sea level that makes basins communicate. So we have a homogenization of the fauna in the different Devonian basins. What do you think happens to the biogeography of the Brazilian and African basins during this period? That was a very long question, Karen. Did you get that? No, no, I got that. Uh, and Renato, yeah. I hope you're doing well, man. Uh, yeah, thanks for that question, dude. Um, so yes, this sort of, these sort of analyses you can, uh, that's sort of the future thinking is that what we could do is have a look at these, doing these analyses in bite-sized components when we have um, better age constraints. Um, so I wanted to do this initially, but South Africa, I'm, I don't believe, I will not, I don't want to say I don't believe, it's just I don't trust some of the dates that we've got. So the Brazilians, well, the stuff that you guys have done, Renato, is, is absolutely fantastic over there in revising. In I think less than 20 years, they've managed to to solve a lot of these conundrums with the age of their rocks and within stratigraphy. So, yes, it can be done at a slice by slice um, uh, time slice period. And th this was not for the entire Devonian. This was specifically for the Pragian uh, Gervetian. Um, as you guys have seen in Brazil, and as we are seeing in South Africa, that same transgression uh, that takes place is that there seems to be a very depauperate fauna um, uh, that's over there, or virtually nothing that takes place. The big question is that we need to actually look at as Gondwanans now in West Gondwana, is what was causing these transgressions. Um, there was no ice cap um, that was melting and you know, gaining ice at the time. So, you know, these are also uh, intraplate basins. What what was causing those transgressions? What was causing those changes in sea level? And I believe I think if we have to figure that one out, um, we will also be able to 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 try and uh, answer that question of yours. So it's one step at a time, and hopefully we can get a. A, you know, some cross pollination among the BRICS nations to actually, or just us for starters, to sort this out. Okay, uh, Cam, if you have some time, we'll just end up with one last question from Bruce Rubich, I think he's writing from somewhere in the middle of the Karoo. Um, yeah. Pointed out that good taxonomy is essential to undertake this work into the future. You've been working on brachiopods, and probably the taxonomy of these groups has been quite well sorted out. But what about other animals, such as mollusks and echinoderms? 
who's doing this work and how can you stimulate more work? So uh, other groups is that we are seeing or in, um, so mollusks are a particular, there's a, there's a very big problem over there, huge problem is that uh, someone very brave needs to have a look at them. In South Africa, no one is looking at them at the moment. Um, in South America, I know of a colleague in, um, in Bolivia that's uh, working on them now. Um, echinoderms, we had very, very was working on them. And unfortunately, we lost her to the UK, so she's up there now. Um, but yes, these other groups uh, need to be looked at, and I even think brachiopods in, uh, need to be looked at again, even. Um, so in ways of stimulating uh, research like this, uh, we it all boils down to universities and uh, funding, at the end of the day, uh, investing in it, and also investing in, in South Africa's youth. Um, I'm a prime indicator, or poster boy, I guess, for um, the NRF investing in an, in, in an invertebrate paleontologist. Um, and we need to look at ways in which we can secure more funding for those sorts of um, projects to take place. So I think it's also about being visual, making your science exciting and inclusive. And that's how you get uh, youngsters involved, is you make them aware about this and its, um, and its implications. Um, so yeah, it, there's no real easy way of doing it, but uh, I'm very hopeful that we can do it. Thanks, okay. Bruce. Kevin, thanks so much, and thanks, Bruce, and thanks for everyone who's watching overseas. That's really wonderful. We really appreciate your attendance at these talks. Uh, here are the talks for, for next week. We can see another paleontological talk from Mark van der Brunt on pariasaurs of the Permian. We look forward to that. And then the week after that, we uh, Stay with the cutting edge uh, geocomputing uh, methodology, and we have a talk from Glenn on computational modeling of all variability using machine learning and sequential Gaussian simulation. So, we have some great diversity of talks in the next two weeks. And before everyone goes, uh, just to remind you that we have our quota of geo uh, social interaction during these lockdown times, and so if you want to join us, uh, feel free to click on the Zoom link that you see in the question and answer bar there. And we have a little bit of social networking uh, or remote networking, should I say, uh, on Zoom after this. And Cameron, please feel free to join us. Uh, and if anyone has any other questions, they can ask Cameron during that, that uh, remote networking session. So thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next week. All the best. Thanks.